Hi everyone. There is so much going on in clinical practice and in research related to hair and COVID-19 that I decided to make a new updated video on this topic. Let's go. There is a huge and increasing public interest in hair loss as measured by the numbers of Google searches for hair loss or hair. I will share with you five different informations and I will start with androgenic alopecia. Many of us heard the term the Gabrin sign. The Gabrin sign comes from the name of Frank Gabrin. It was an emergency doctor who was one of the first doctors to die of COVID-19. He was known for his publications about patient care and especially for the sentence, every doctor will find herself or himself on the other side of the stethoscope. And because he was such a great person, and because he had androgenic alopecia, the persons who were first to describe the association of androgenic alopecia with a severe course of COVID-19 called this phenomenon the Gabrin sign. Since then, there are some controversies because some articles and some scientists confirm this association, while others believe that there is more to this topic than just the pure association between androgenic alopecia and a severe course of the disease in terms of COVID-19. There are even several numbers to confirm the association between the severity of COVID-19 and androgenic alopecia in men. And this is one of the studies which was published just recently. It has shown that approximately 13% of the patient with no androgenic alopecia will have a moderate to severe course of COVID-19, while in terms of patients who have androgenic alopecia, almost 90% are likely to have moderate to severe COVID-19. And these authors claim that the odds ratio of a person, of a man with androgenic alopecia to have a moderate to severe COVID-19 course is approximately 80. This means an 80-fold higher probability of a man with androgenic alopecia to have a more severe course of COVID-19. However, one thing which the authors did not take into consideration is that by definition, the patients with androgenic alopecia are usually older compared to the ones who have no androgenic alopecia and also the older patients are more likely to develop a more severe disease. So there are more data which are needed to confirm this association. Despite some controversy, there are many data which indicate this association and even more. There are some data which show that antiandrogens may influence the severity of COVID-19. And even going further, this was discussed whether or not there may be a role of finasteride and dutasteride, the drugs which we use in everyday practice, whether they may have an influence on the course of COVID-19. A study which I like in particular is this study from a few weeks ago. It was an outpatient study and the patients who were confirmed with COVID-19, they received either dutasteride at the dose of 0.5 milligram daily for 30 days or placebo. And it was quite surprising to see that the patients who did receive dutasterides, they were better off compared to patients on placebo. The patients on the dutasteride had less fatigue, shorter disease duration, and a lower serum level of inflammatory elements. And they also had a faster clinical recovery and oxygen saturation on average. One may ask, how about women? Well, there are not many studies about women and androgenic alopecia in the context of COVID. However, most available data show that there's no association between female androgenic alopecia and the COVID-19. So the course of the disease, it seems, will be the same in an average woman with androgenic alopecia as compared to an average woman with no androgenic alopecia. So to summarize this part of my presentation, androgenic alopecia may predispose to a more severe course of COVID-19, and it has been documented quite well in men. However, there are not many studies in women. And also, finasteride and dutasteride may have some protective role. Telogen effluvium. COVID-19, like almost every inflammatory disease, may cause 
hair loss, telogen effluvium. And it has been shown that approximately 24% of patients who have COVID-19 will subsequently develop hair loss. And the average time from COVID-19 symptoms to the first symptoms of telogen effluvium is approximately two months. However, as you see in this graph, already few days after the onset of symptoms of COVID-19, some patients may develop the first sign of telogen effluvium. The good news is that the telogen effluvium stops usually not later than after 200 days, and the average time of the duration of hair loss after COVID-19 is approximately 76 days. This is a trichoscopy image of a person who developed telogen effluvium after COVID-19 and it has the typical trichoscopy features of telogen effluvium and especially the presence of multiple follicular units with only one hair. And there are also studies ongoing to see whether or not the blood vessels, which we see in these patients and also one of them in this image, whether they may have any diagnostic or prognostic value in COVID-19. Persons who have a more severe course of COVID-19 are more likely to develop a more severe hair loss. And this is quite understandable because of the probable effect of the cytokine storm on the hair follicle. There is no single factor which has been clearly associated with the hair loss in patients with COVID-19. One may think that this may be fever. However, some patients who develop telogen effluvium had never fever in the course of their COVID-19 disease. We also have to keep in mind that COVID-19 is a disease with low oxygen levels and our hair follicles do not like low oxygen. The patients who develop telogen effluvium after COVID-19 are likely to also have one symptom which is not associated with any other subtype of telogen effluvium and this is trichodynia, the scalp pain. And 20% of patients with telogen effluvium associated with COVID-19 will have trichodynia and this is a symptom which will resolve spontaneously with no additional treatment. A summary from this part of my presentation, approximately 24% of patients with COVID-19 will develop telogen effluvium. It develops usually two months after COVID-19 and resolves in many cases spontaneously after another three months. What is specific for telogen effluvium associated with COVID-19 is the presence or the coexistence of trichodynia. There is only one study which is focused on trichotillomania. It was a survey which was done in a target population and among this population were persons who were owners of a habit awareness bracelet. This is a bracelet which is vibrating when a person is trying to touch a predefined area. And these studies have shown that there is an increased frequency of hair pulling during the pandemic. And this is also what I see in my office. I see an increased number of patients with trichotillomania. And I believe that we have to look for trichotillomania in persons who are now visiting our offices. Few key points about alopecia areata. There are some case reports of patients who developed alopecia areata during the pandemic, and it was attributed partly to the stress which was associated with either with the quarantine or with the fear of acquiring the disease. There are also some data which may indicate a higher incidence of alopecia areata during the pandemic, or maybe more precisely, a higher number of patients being diagnosed with the disease. We were surprised to see, and we made a small study to show the effect of COVID-19 on the course of alopecia areata in patients who had alopecia areata prior to developing COVID-19. And we were quite surprised to see that COVID-19 as a rule had no effect on the course of alopecia areata. I am sure that every dermatologist had multiple questions from the patients about the vaccination and about the systemic treatment in the context of the COVID-19 vaccine. The answer to question number one, should I get vaccinated, is easy. Yes, you should. The answer to question number two, 
Will the systemic immunosuppressive therapy for my hair disease have an effect on the response to the vaccine? Here we have no clear data, especially there are no data which are specifically from studies of the COVID-19 vaccine. So we kind of have to extrapolate the data from other infections and other vaccines. I looked through the literature and also to the recommendations which are listed below in the slide and I have developed my own approach to the dose of immunosuppressive treatments in patients with hair loss in my practice. In most cases, I will decrease the dose of immunosuppressive treatments in my hair patients for two weeks after the vaccine. Sometimes I do a two-week pause if I believe that this will have no negative impact on the patient's health or on the disease. So in summary, finasteride and dutasteride may have some protective value in patients with mild COVID-19 in the outpatient setting. Second, telogen effluvium develops in approximately one-fourth of patients with COVID-19 and in most cases it is likely to resolve spontaneously. Third, in my opinion, COVID-19 does not have a significant effect on the course of alopecia areata. Fourth, trichotillomania may develop into a significant problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, I personally stop immunosuppressive therapy for two weeks or decrease the dose by half in patients who receive immunosuppressive therapy for hair diseases. However, in every case, I make the decision individually, taking into consideration the possible adverse events of stopping or decreasing the dose of the drug. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to my channel.